Hello and welcome to the next session of Client Collectors. Today we're going to be looking at modelling and prototyping. So our learning objectives for today, we're going to develop our knowledge of the design process and in line with that we're going to identify the importance of prototyping. So don't worry if you don't know what that means right now, we're going to cover that in this lesson. And we're going to create and evaluate our own prototypes. So what is prototyping? When designers are creating a new product, it is important to bring their product into the 3D world. This takes the form of prototyping in which designers can make models of their potential designs. This allows a designer to experiment with the design before making any big, expensive decisions. Making a model or prototype can happen at any stage of the design process, but it usually starts after an idea is drawn and multiple prototypes can be made. It's a low cost way of identifying any problems with a design at an early stage. Models can be made from just about anything you like, including low cost options for rough models, such as card, paper, or items you can find in your recycling bin. Or you can have high end models made from more valuable materials like wood, metal, or plastics. Sometimes designers can make hundreds of prototypes until they achieve the design that they're looking for. One designer renowned and his prototyping is Sir James Dyson. Now we'll talk about him in a little bit more detail a bit later on. So to summarise what's been said there, you've got an idea which starts out as a drawing. And then to get an idea of how that's going to feel in the real world, designers can make models or prototypes. And they can be made from card, foam, plastics, and you can make lots of them until you get the design that you like. And then once you've done that, that can lead to the development of the final product. So some other benefits of prototyping is that having a physical model of the design can be very useful to present to a client. Now, if a client had asked you to design, let's see here, a vacuum cleaner, you could make the model, take it to them and then ask for their thoughts. And it's much easier for a client to talk about the product if it's there right in front of them. It provides an opportunity for feedback between the client and the designer on any proposed ideas. It also gives the designer a chance to make any required adjustments in the design to make sure it's in keeping with the client's wants and needs. So for this task, we're asking you to write three or more reasons why a designer might make a prototype. So feel free to pause the video and just make your little list there and then you can start playing it once you're done. So for the next task, we're going to focus on Dyson. It's going to be a task where you read and you find information. So the next slide is going to look just like this. You'll see all the information you need is presented on the left hand side and there are some questions for you to answer on the right hand side. And you'll notice at the bottom, there's a little area here for you to work out the percentage of your mark, okay? So what's gonna happen is I'm gonna read this through with you for the first time, and then you can pause the video and answer the questions and just write them down on the paper that you've got in front of you. Sir James Dyson, born 2nd of May, 1947, is a British inventor, industrial designer, and founder of the Dyson Company. He is best known as inventor of the dual cyclone bagless vacuum cleaner, which works on the principle of cyclonic separation. According to the Sunday Times Rich List 2017, his net worth is 16.2 billion. His first original invention, the ball barrow, was a modified version of a wheelbarrow using a ball instead of a wheel. This was featured on the BBC Tomorrow's World television program. Dyson stuck with the idea of a ball, inventing the trolley ball, a trolley that launched boats. He then designed the wheel boat, which could travel at speeds of 40 miles per hour on both land and water. In the late 1970s, Dyson had the idea of using cyclonic separation to create a vacuum cleaner that would not lose suction as it picked up dirt. He became frustrated with his Hoover's diminishing performance the dust bag pores kept becoming clogged with dust, reducing suction. The cyclone idea came from a sawmill that used cyclone technology. After five years and about 5,127 prototypes, Dyson launched the G-Force Cleaner in 1983. 
However, no manufacturer or distributor would handle this product in the UK as it would disturb the market for replacement dust bags. So Dyson launched it in Japan through catalog sales. Manufactured in bright pink, the G4 sold for the equivalent of £2,000. It won the 1991 International Design Fair Prize in Japan. He filed a series of patents for his dual cyclone vacuum cleaner in 1980. In October 2006, Dyson launched the, the Dyson Airblade, a fast hand dryer that uses a thin sheet of moving air to remove water rather than attempting to evaporate it with heat. This allows faster drying while using much less energy than traditional electrical hand dryers. Another product launched on the 18th of October 2009 is a fan without external blades, which he calls the air multiplier. In addition to a cooling fan, a model was which distributes electrically produced heat and an ultrasonic humidifier model are also available. In April 2016, Dyson launched the Dyson Supersonic, a hand dryer with a smaller motor located in the handle so as to provide better balance and smaller size as well as a quieter operation. Commenting on the launch, Vogue magazine said, as the first product to launch from Dyson's new UK state-of-the-art hair laboratory, we have high hopes for the future of our blow dries. Okay, so if you've not finished answering the questions, I'd suggest you go back in the video and finish off from questions one to 10. And then we're gonna check our own answers. We're gonna self-evaluate on this one. So going through what we've done so far, what is Sir James Dyson's net worth? We should have our answer. So James Dyson's net worth is 16.2 billion. The number two, what was his first original invention? His first invention was the ball barrel. So well done if you've got these. Moving on to number three, what inspired the cyclone idea? That's right, the cyclone idea came from a sawmill that used cyclone technology. Now you need to write that whole answer down to have the mark for that one. Number four, how many prototypes were produced before the launch of the G-Force? Now I could not quite believe how many prototypes he made. 5,127. Where did Dyson originally launch his bagless vacuums? The answer is Japan. He launched them in Japan at first. Number six. What are the two benefits of using the Dyson Airblade over the traditional hand dryer? The Airblade um, allows faster drying while using less energy. Personally, I think it looks a bit nicer too, but that's up for debate. For debate. So if you got those two, that's one mark there. Question seven. What product was manufactured in bright pink? And how much was it sold for? So again, you need both parts to get the point. Did, it was a G-Force selling for the equivalent of £2,000. My goodness. Number eight. How old was Sir James Dyson when he launched the air multiplier? He was 62. Now that one required a little bit of math, looking at when he was born at the start, all the way to when he launched it right at the end there. So he was 62 years old. Well done if you got that one. Number nine, what sets the Dyson supersonic hair dryer apart from other hair dryers? It has a smaller motor located inside the handle. And number 10, what award did Dyson win in 1991? He won the International Design Fair Prize. So well done if you got most of them. Hello everyone, um, we're going to be looking at prototyping and modeling today. Now, prototyping and modeling is when you take an idea that you have, such as the one we've been looking at, with the, the throne based on cakes, and then you turn it into a real life, tangible object, so you can get an idea of how your design is gonna look in the real world. Now, this isn't high quality, it looks a bit scruffy, it's a bit messy, but it allows us to have an idea of that design in the real world. Okay, so let's show you how we get it done. Now usually 
when we're modeling we have some basic equipment we use some card we'll always use a safety ruler and then we can also use a, a craft knife or an exacto blade and then you've got your pencil and pencil now I know most of you are at home and you probably don't have this material so if not that's okay we'll throw that out the window too all you really need is your sketchbook or some blank paper out of maybe another workbook or if you've got some scrap paper lying about the house you'll need maybe a couple sheets so let's say two sheets there we go easy peasy some scissors and some tape and a pencil that's it guys that's all you're going to need for this task okay now I'm going to use a ruler as well however it's just not essential you can use anything with a straight side if it's a book or you know anything you can find with a straight edge now the easiest way to get started is to have a picture of what you're going to be doing so from your last lesson you designed a chair you might have done it online you might have done it on paper whatever you've got if you've opened your laptop up in front of you or if you've got the designs that you drew if you have them out in front of you that's absolutely fine too now I'm just going to start I'm not going to do this to scale so it's not going to be you know super accurate but it's going to give us an idea of it in the real life so what I like to do with our model is I think about it I think about the object from different perspectives so I'm thinking about it from this way I'm thinking about it from this way I'm going to think about the front view as well and then I'm also going to think about how it looks from the back the back view okay now I've got a front view here of my design so this is going to be the chair so what I'm going to draw I'm going to draw a quick box okay I'm going to make it I'm just going to draw a line across the whole page here and I'm going to say about there okay so when I measure that box it's going to be yep yeah, let's see seven and a half by nine that's fine so this is going to be the front view now I'm just going to quickly draw those shapes into the front view doesn't have to be super accurate just a kind of rough idea and then it's going to come down like that that's fine so we've got we've almost got two fronts we've got this part which would be this section of the chair the very front and then we've got that other part we can see at the back there so this is the part I'm drawing at the moment okay all right now I'm not going to color this don't worry about color because it's just a model you're just getting an idea of how it looks that's fine for now right I'm going to move on to the left and the right now for this model it was about eight again so it's just, it's the same height as it is wide okay so for the left hand side I'm going to be drawing this that's how you see it but you won't have that model to look at so you're going to look at your drawings here I'm going to be drawing these shapes okay because I'm looking at it from this side and the left and the right hand side depending on your design and this one they're exactly the same as each other they're just flipped okay so we'll just get this drawn up really quickly here Now we've got this lovely piece of icing going around the bottom, so that's important to put that in. Mm. And then we've got the edge of the cake wrap it there, and then it stops up here at the chair, and then we've got the lines that go down. That makes sense. Now this is just blank space, so is this part and this part. So I'm just going to make sure these are the right size, 8, and this is going to go to 8 centimeters as well. Then we're going to do the same thing for the other side, 
I'm just going to put this quickly on here. I'm not going to spend too long on this. It would be really good if you lot can make your models much neater than this. I'm just going to run through this quickly. Something up for you. Right, I'm going to cut these out. And then we'll be able to start visualising them all coming together. three pieces now when we're joining them together looking at looking at this section here this back part of the chair it's got a width to it okay so it's about that thick okay we know that it's there it's not just a flat piece of card that's why on this part I've left this section these are going to stick together and then we're going to start going around the top to form that thick edge at the back okay so that in the the finished model it looks something a bit like this okay so it's not just a piece of card at the back we've got quite a lot to it all right so I'm just going to cut some pieces of tape and then we can get these stuck together all right now there's not much skill involved in sticking all these parts together I'm just using really rough cut little bits of masking tape and you don't need to worry about if you can see the tape or not that's fine it's just a model sticking these together okay so we've got something that kind of stands up for now which is good let's just kind of visualize it straight away now the next section that I want to concentrate on is this part that I can see very very much from the front okay now I know that when I made this part that was a measurement again I think it was about seven and a half wasn't it yep so now I know to make the front of my model seven and a half centimeters across so grab a, a piece of paper that's fine so seven and a half give it a mark there we go and then to get the height of this section I'm just going to measure this part here. So it's 40. So we'll put this down. 40 millimeters. There we go. Now from the front, we've got this lovely U shape and then these two circular pieces at the top. So I'm just going to draw them in. Circular piece, circular piece. And very roughly like this and so once again I'm just going to cut that out and then I can start to assemble this together so again I'm just going to put two more bits of tape on the front and have that sitting on there all right And another little bit of tape. There we go. Now, so quite quickly, we've already got got something that's starting to look like our chair. There's a lot of bits missing, but we you know we're getting there. Right, I'm just going to fold these bits out of the way for now. Right, so we were talking about the back. Now the back's open, so we should probably put this piece on the back that we've made for this one, okay? So what I should have done actually was trace the same shape I had for the front, cut it out so I could stick it on the back. So I'll do that quickly now. And then again, just going to use some tape and we can fasten that in place.
And the more pieces you add to it, it might get a little fiddly, but that's okay. You can just take your time with it and make it as neat as possible. always use you can cut tiny bits of paper and if you've got some kind of glue stick or PVA you can glue it, it might take a little longer to dry but it'll still work all right it's looking okay we've got the back piece now it's looking quite good now I'm just gonna cut a little bit of card to fill in this hole at the top this little scrap piece should fit quite nicely going to fold it to get that point of the, the ice in and be able to stick that down there perfect all right that'll do just going to add two more bits of tape and then we can start working on the last couple of pieces for our model all right perfect right now I'm going to tackle the the Battenberg cushion that we've got here. Okay, so we've just got a square of card in the top that I've um, taped from underneath it to give the illusion of the cushion. All right, so if our measurements are correctly, this will be seven and a half, and then we'll measure the depth of the cushion. Okay. Okay, so it should be 60. So this piece of scrap should be able to do that just fine. 60. Yep. Uh, oh, perfect. Perfect. Gonna put some stripes on it. Okay, and same again. Probably need about two or three pieces of tape here. And then we'll get it stuck on. Alright, we'll start off with one piece. Now I'm gonna go underneath it first, just put it in. And what I want to do is pay attention to this lip because this is where the height of the cushion should be from. So I'm going to tape it in there first. Right about there. Perfect. Now I can fold it down just like so. It's staying in itself, which is nice, but I'm just going to put a couple bits of tape underneath anyway just to hold it in place. between these two models besides the colour on this one okay which again is not essential but if you want to do it that's absolutely fine gives you a better understanding of your object in the real world the last piece we've really got to put on is the armrests here okay now if you look back to the design these pieces are curved so it's not just as easy as cutting straight pieces of cardboard so what I've done here is I've cut a little panel of cardboard and I've rolled it and then taped it into place so it gives it that nice smooth curve that looks just like an armrest. Okay, so I think we measured this as 40 millimeters, 4 centimeters earlier. Oh, my bad, 60. So we're just going to need two pieces of card, 60 by about 30. Let's see, there's 60 there. Now 
and I'm just going to roll it slightly. Okay, so it kind of stays like that in a curve. Okay, so if I was to put it down, freestanding. And then again, with just a little bit of tape. I'm going to be able to just take the edge of it to the edge of our chair already and then curve it inside. And that looks okay, doesn't it? We're forming the curve of that armrest. Now, there's a couple gaps at the front here, so what we can do is put another piece of tape just to hold it right in place. And then I'm going to do the same to the other side. Okay, so now I've got both of the armrests on. The front looks good. It's looking good from the sides. The back looks good. Uh, we don't need to worry too much about underneath, that's fine. So when you're making your model, before you assemble it, if you wanted to add the detail and the colour, like I've done with this one, absolutely go for it. It's going to look much better in the end result and it's actually easier for you to kind of visualise your pieces as you're putting them together. So once you've finished, you can take a photograph of your, your work and attach it to the assignment for today's work, okay? Otherwise, 